lesson and what yes. should we cover? So um, we are now starting with the lesson of reproducible research or preparing code to be usable by you and others in the future, as we have added as a subtitle to this. Um, and we have here a lot of learning outcomes and we will cover a lot of different topics and we will jump around a lot. And this is meant all for giving you um, an introduction to these topics and like that you can later go and look more deeper into the sections that you're interested in. Um, so we will talk a little bit about uh, directory structure and how this might have influence on your um, work. Then we will also look at dependencies, what they are and how they can be documented. Um, we, we will look at the workflow tools. So if you have many computational steps that you want to do as part of your research, then um, how can you document them? How can you run them as one? Um, we will discuss a little bit the containers, what they are, how they can be used. Um, and then also like, what are the actual use cases for these different different tools in the very end? And um, because we are now at day one of week two, uh, which introduces a lot of different topics, not only this lesson introduces a lot of different topics, but this whole week has a lot of different topics and tools that we're going to, going, going to introduce to you. We wanted to try to give you a little bit of an overview on how it all connects, because maybe someone could also say that this reproducible research topic is what a code refinery workshop could be called, because we cover kind of all the topics that are related to this reproducible research topic. And we will talk about what that means a little bit more in a bit. But um, so we found this wonderful graphics made by Heidi Seibold. And we use this here to um, check the steps that you can follow to make your own research more reproducible. And then we added uh, what kind of lessons we have in this workshop, uh, week one and week two, that uh, cover these topics or at least uh, introduce you to these topics so that you have like some more to go off. Um, so in the very beginning, it's like get your files and folders in order. So everything really starts with that you have a good overview of your files uh, that you have, of your data, of your source code, uh, of your manuscript. And we will uh, look into this a little bit today. Um, then using good names for files, folders, and functions is basically where the documentation of your code also starts. So we will talk about this a little bit more in uh, tomorrow morning session, how to document your research software, and then also on the last day in modular code development. Uh, document with care. So you usually don't only have your code, but you also want to tell other people how to use it, how to install it, um, what it actually does behind the scenes. So we will have a whole sec, uh, a whole lesson about this two hours uh, tomorrow morning, talking about the different ways on how you can do documentation and the different levels and for what they might be good, what they might be good for. Then last week was all about version control. So you learned hopefully a lot and got a lot out of this uh, day one, two, three, uh, with the introduction to version control with Git and the collaborative distributed version control. Um, here also a reminder that you can still watch those videos. They will um, be on YouTube also, where you can come back later and uh, check those out again. And also the materials are still available. Then stabilizing the computing environment and software. Uh, and that's maybe one step deeper into the topic um, where we also will be talking about this a little bit today. Then we have tomorrow um, a whole lesson on Jupyter Notebooks, which is one way of how you can like provide your um, computing environment. Then in automatic testing and also modular code development, um, there will be some sections about how you can do this uh, for you and for others to make, make things more reproducible. 
And then also publishing your research outputs, publishing code, publishing your data, other documents. And that will be um, one of the topics uh, today afternoon in the social coding and open software section. So that's a little overview over um, how these lessons maybe all connect. I hope you got a little bit of a better overview um, and can put these um, building blocks that we will give you a little bit better together now. And let's go on to the motivation of reproducible research lesson. Enrico, yes. do you want to continue? I can give some motivation. Maybe one thing that I want to add related to, you know, everything that you're learning here, it doesn't mean that from tomorrow you have to start all the best practices. You know, we people often talk about good enough practices. So if you pick one thing to improve in your process, in your work workflows, that's already a lot. And every day you can add, one day you start adding Git, another day you will make your environment more reproducible. So it's hopefully this workshop is something that you will get back to it, to these materials and and try to, you know, slowly, slowly go towards the so-called best practices. But a bit of motivation, there's no questions in the AKMD, so we don't need to, to you know, discuss about anything. So sometimes people might wonder, okay, why is reproducibility important? And of course, maybe this seems kind of obvious when it comes to academia, to scientific method, but I guess one also needs to remember the reproducibility is important everywhere, not just in academia, meaning that, you know, if you're, if you work in a company and your software one day works and the day after doesn't work, or if you provide a service and, you know, every other day there's a different uh, outcome, then maybe, you know, that there's a problem. But if we keep the context in academia, there's a nice cartoon here from PhD Comics where we see the, you know, the old school senior professor having a conversation with a doctoral researcher, most likely. So I'll try to do the voices. Is the, the professor is saying, well, don't worry. You don't have to start your code from scratch, you know? You can just reuse the software that the previous person did many, you know, years ago. And then, of course, the, the doctoral research is like, okay, is, are there some instruction how to use it? No, I doubt it. Is, is the code commented? Mm, not likely. Where are the... the the, what is it saying that the, the the flex who knows so this is going to be painful isn't it and the professor say well no it's just a scratch so this is just a you know funny way to put something that is actually not funny at all that unfortunately for many years different scientific fields have suffered the so-called reproducibility crisis i'm sure you've heard about it and if you work in a specific field, you can literally just Google for reproducibility crisis and and um, and your field of research. If you scroll a little bit up in this blue box, here there are, for example, you know, the type of anecdotes that are actually scary, you know, and not, not funny at all. For example, that, you know, you obtain some great results and submit the, the work, and then there's the review process, which usually takes, you know, between six months or 12 months. And then, you know, reviewer number two is I was going to ask you to do some changes and generate new figures with slightly different pre-processing. And then when working on the revision, the researcher realized, oh, we're not even able to create the old figures. Everything, you know, the library that we were using for making the figures doesn't exist anymore. It's not compatible anymore with whatever new operating system we are running. So suddenly, you know, something that was kind of given for granted is not working anymore. And so this, but not just this, is one of the issues that are related to this reproducibility crisis that I was mentioning. In the picture that you see now here below, there are some histograms. We don't need to go to the details, but and the reproducibility crisis is something that maybe gained track in the kind of from the year 2010, 2015. So it kind of started from the psychology, but of course it's not just limited to psychology. It really extended to all the to all the fields. In this survey that Nature Journal give 
was it in 2016 yeah so they were basically asking to the to the researchers have you failed to reproduce an experiment or do you perceive that there is a reproducibility crisis and in general everyone was agreeing over the years you know as i mentioned already you can search for your field of of science of of research and type reproducibility crisis and there are papers meta analysis and whatever collection of articles that would show that any field of science has issue you are need this with a statistician from stanford said many times that basically everything that is published half of the things are are false they're just not true whether it's an issue of you know rep- the reproducibility of the findings or maybe a more higher level issue that maybe the phenomena that you're trying to measure is a phenomena that is inherently random or it has lots of variation that we can't control for but in general all this contributes to the reproducibility crisis but then trying to limit the scope what could be the levels of reproducibility so in this pyramid here we can see that the article is just at the is just at the top of the pyramid most likely if you work in academia and if your output is research then you know the article is all you get which is is kind of consider okay the article is self contained and should have everything i challenge you to take an article from your field that you really appreciate and just by reading the article try to reproduce their findings maybe you're lucky maybe they even provide some data with it so you have a, at least that the data is the same but if the documentation is missing if the code is missing you 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 just have to start guessing how they implemented the actual analysis going from the data to the final to the final results and most likely it will not be possible to just reproduce them without knowing the code and without having the documentation how to run the code but let's imagine that you are even in the excellent case that the data is provided with the article and the code and the documentation you still might end up not being able to reobtain the same numbers and this is where the environment comes in it's not really the environment as in uh, nature and nurture but it's more related in this case to the software and computational environment so basically what we are focusing here in this lesson today is the so called computational reproducibility the fact that we understand that some phenomena in science in life might not be reproducible themselves might be very difficult to measure but at least from the computational point of view we want to control the environment the hardware the software the libraries and given the same data and the same code we want to basically be able to reproduce the same numbers now this might seem at the beginning i thought well this is obvious it's uh, how how difficult can it be to just you know it's just pressing a button and re getting the same data and re obtaining the same numbers but after working at the beginning i thought it was just easy but then i realized all the sorts of dependencies that you know down to the type of hardware they are using up to the highest level of the code and the libraries and and these kind of things so it would be nice to have a little discussion that we can use for the collaborative document so right now in the collaborative document i'm pasting some of the questions that are written there and maybe I could start by asking this question to Samantha. <laughs> so, and of course everyone who is who is following us, please please write your your thoughts on this. But in general, Samantha, what are your experiences in rerunning or adjusting a script or a figure that you created a few months ago? Uh that was actually the reason why I did the very first code refinery course that I attended as a learner like 5 years back or something was that I had exactly this problem like half a year later someone asked me to recreate a figure and I had such a mess with everything with data with uh the code with, so that it was really really hard and it took really really long time to get this figure recreated and then it looked a little bit different and I did not remember like what was it that I actually did uh, even manually like uh, not even with code but that I like tweaked uh some i don't know arrow heads or something like this in inkscape afterwards um 
so yeah, had had this experience a lot, and uh, since then it has gotten a lot better because there was a lot that I learned in this in this workshop about the tools that you can use to to make your future life easier, uh, and then uh, as a side effect also make life for others uh, easier that want to rerun your code. How about that's, you? Yeah, no, that's a very great point about the manual fixing in the figures i guess everyone has done it at some point you know because the axis did not look right and then you know you're in a hurry the, the 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 professor is waiting for the picture and you don't have time to check whatever programming language library is making those axes and those tick bars but then the thing is this in, in a way there's nothing wrong with editing a figure with Inkscape or with Photoshop, if it would be documented, if somewhere someone would write uh, the arrows must be fixed with, you know, Illustrator or Inkscape. And then the next person could could basically follow the same process. But unfortunately, this is not happening. We're a bit more lucky with the code than what we saw last, last week with, with Git, because then we can at least try to document a little bit, you know, you should do this, you should do that to reobtain the same figure. But then another nice thing that you pointed out is that you you felt already that the, the, this collaboration and this reproducibility, is it was like between your past self and your future self. So in the end, this was maybe touched a bit last week, the biggest collaborator, the biggest, you know, colleague that you will all have is yourself, is your future self. So you know that if you document things today, and if you try to make things a little bit more reproducible today, your future self will be very thankful and very grateful that that this was documented and that it's possible to start from where it was left. We still have three minutes before continuing. We have a nice planned schedule so that, you know, we can leave some time for you to write your, your thoughts. And it's nice to see that people are experiencing, you know, this, this type of issues with their code but then there's another scenario that i don't know if it's more rare or maybe less frequent than collaborating with yourself but this happens again all the time because of course if a excellent researcher is writing good code then maybe you know they would like to share it with the with the colleagues but often what happens in academia and in research organizations is that people leave and leave behind some code that maybe it was not fully documented or, you know, fully carefully uh, written. As it ever happened to you, Samantha, that you had to continue someone else's work and this person has left, there was no way to contact it. So you basically had to start doing this type of detective work, or as we saw last time, <laughs> archaeology work, trying to figure out which library version was in 2016, March. <laughs> you know, <laughs> did it happen to you or...? Luckily, not yet. Um, so usually when I continued work of someone else, that person was still working there, not with this specific code, but it, they were still uh, approachable. And in most cases, also very helpful. Like they understood that I had these questions, like how do I actually set up the code? Uh, um, what do I need to do to run the most basic functionality or something? And then we had little sessions sitting together, going through this um, because they had not written it down, but they of course knew how to do it. So we were like using Zoom sessions to go through it and uh, do that all there. And then I used my notes to then um, like write my own documentation and in some cases also added it then for future me, future other people. Um, to the code so that um, other people may not have to do this sitting down for hours and going through the code together, but um, rather can read it by themselves and then only contact if there's any questions. For me, in this case, it was um, some published code. I, w I needed to reuse what they did. No research was available. The code was on GitHub. I even opened an issue asking them, you know, could you help me? I'm not able to to reproduce your your code and I need to run it with different data. 
And then I just started this uh, archaeology that we like we did last time. So I started to look at the commits and which date they were done, what was the version of NumPy in those months, in those years, and then what other, what pandas, what other Python libraries were in that moment in time. And then I was able, it, it wasn't even, they didn't even specify if it was Python 2 or Python 3. So I had to even, you know, figure everything out. But in the end, I, I managed and... I, I, I guess my GitHub is still somewhere open with my solution. <laughs> but then what what's next, Samantha, in the in our Yes. So we will we will go now into uh, a brief excursion into organizing projects. But before that I would like to mention for the exercise leads that you are prepared for this in this session today. Um, before 12 finish time, we will have two exercises, uh, one at about uh, 10.35 finish time, so in 15 minutes, about um, workflow tools, and then uh, later at 10.40 finish time about containers, where it's more about discussing about containers. Um, those are the two exercise sessions we will we will have today. And then we have uh, lots of things that we can put and discuss in the collaborative document. Okay. So um, I mentioned already that organizing uh, your project is already where it all starts. And this might be um, very obvious to you all, but we still wanted to add it here because it belongs to this reproducible research workflow. So we can, um, take a look here. So this is um, one uh, project directory organization, how you could start it if you, for example, don't have like your own way of how you start a project yet, you could take this um, as a starting point and uh, organize your projects that way. So here we also have that we have uh, one uh, folder for each project so that whenever you need to get back to that project, you find everything that is related to that project in this one folder and don't have to go all the way around. Um, then we have seen readme files already last week in uh, the GitHub lessons probably. Um, and even if you don't have it all on Git, a readme file is always like good to have also in your project folder to remind yourself uh, what was this project about, what is the content of this folder, um, and these kind of things. Then the data, we can split this in, uh, for example, the raw data and the process data, or you can have data and then process data under this um, with as many like subdirectories at as makes sense for you. Like there's no, no really one fits all, but you have to like see a little bit what, what is it, what you may need and um, what you may also not need anymore in the future. The manuscript can be also in the same folder depending on how you write it. Um, the resulting files, so that especially when you get the, your reviews back and um, you have to recreate some figures or something, then it, make it as easy as possible for yourself to find these like actual results of your studies. Um, again, then if you have some uh, source code, you can have it here. Um, we will learn a li little bit later about licenses and what are these requirements, the text files. So these can be like together with your code and then the documentation. Also, you can have it separate like here or also um, as, for example, a readme file in your um, source directory. And there's many like different ways of how you can call those, and that is something you can find out for yourself. Um, also, what you want to track actually with Git, for example. Um, do you only want to track like version control your source code? Do you also want to version control your data? Uh, do you want to version control your results, your manuscript? Um, these are all things that you like. have to know yourself what it, what makes sense in your case. Um, one really nice functionality um, of Git and also then uh, GitHub 
that I learned fairly late about was this git tag um, functionality where you can tag a certain version of, for example, your source, your source code um, when you, for example, submitted a manuscript. So that if you further develop your code after you submitted a manuscript and you then get some reviews, you know exactly like what was the version. Um, that these reviewers have actually seen. So you can go back there and you can then say, for example, hey, I've actually implemented this afterwards, check here. Or um, you can find out what they might actually um, mean. Um, and then also the publications. So there is also like how you like to write, what kind of um, format you want to choose. I think nowadays pretty common, I would say, is this uh, overleaf with LaTeX um, editor. So you can have all your manuscript online. You can invite collaborators there. You have uh, many universities have their templates there already. So you can uh, concentrate on actually writing your stuff and don't have to worry about like, how do you need to format uh, this text to fit with your universities or the journals guidelines also. Um, and then there's many other tools that um, can help you with these uh, publications. Enrico, do you have a favorite here for manuscripts? Well, I guess the issue that I'm facing often is that I'm writing with more senior authors and in a field that is not kind of computational related, which in practice means no LaTeX. So then Google Docs, or I believe also this word, Microsoft Word can be used in a um, kind of collaborative manner. You know, it is not the best tool. And with this tool, for example, you, you can't really use, for example, Git with uh, documents like Microsoft Word because it, it's not really able to track the actual changes. But it's a compromise with the with the collaborators you work with. Or if if we maybe with more junior collaborators, we, we are being able to use Overleaf. I'm quite happy about it. But it's interesting also this this we will not have time here to cover all this, you know, binder and other and other tools. But in general, there's an ecosystem of of tools that you can kind of share with your paper. You can not just have the paper, but have a kind of, um, how could I say, like a dynamic paper with the paper, like, a, you know, tell the story with the data and let the let the readers even change some parameters in the visualization or in the in the analysis. So there's, there's, there's really great, um, great tools for this type of things. When it comes to this discussion part, so I pasted in this collaborative document the questions that you see here. Again, these are more of a self-reflection that um, we are, of course, curious to hear what are you using for writing academic papers with others. And in general, you know, if, um, if this collaboration with others, you know, how do you organize your projects? Maybe one last comment that I want to say regarding, you know, folder structure and file structure. It, it's not a, you know, there's no good or bad way to do it. But I always like to think, if we think of kind of the kitchen metaphor or the, you know, that in, if you enter a kitchen, most likely you don't need to read the manual. You know where the stove is, you know where the fridge is, and you already know what the stove kind of is expected to be doing so having a, a good folder structure can let you know if you if you win the lottery and and then move to a desert island someone else can join can go back to the folder structure that you left and most likely they already know where to continue but let's now maybe have a little bit on the so-called computational steps and what do we mean with that and after this brief page then we can actually start talking about the exercise that you will do so in this introduction i'm kind of trying to set the context for the exercise and then um, you will have 25 minutes for doing the actual exercise and uh, after that we will have a break 
But basically, what does it mean, recorded computational step? Well, maybe if I stay with this type of kitchen idea, is that when you're cooking, you you know you might be doing um, you might need some ingredients and you might need different tools. If the you know if you want to put it simply, that the ingredients would be the data, and the recipe would be kind of the code that you need to you know first chop the onion and then fry it. Um, sometimes maybe what you're cooking is simple enough that you know that there's only a few steps that go one after the other and they can maybe follow a linear a linear code in your in your script so normally you would have a script that could be a python script an r script or also any sort of script it could be a bash script or you know anything that can basically sequentially run some some commands but sometimes things get a little bit more complicated it could well be that for example, in the exercise that we will cover here, in this, um, I think it's a little bit up in this uh, page, that um, that for example here in this in this exercise that we will that you will will try to do, they need to basically run the same recipe, which is doing some word counting on on a on a book. So that you know, you basically for every word that is contained in the in the book, you can get a basically a frequency like the the statistic of how many times the different words are are present in the book. And so often in in various fields of science, you know, it's not that you just have a single book, you run the recipe once and that's it. You might have many books. So in this case here, you know, there could be four books, and so this would mean that you would need to rerun four times the different thing but then you start you you can guess that you know if instead of just having four books we will need to process 500 books then you understand that we are going we are basically touching a bit the topic of parallelization parallelization is powerful because in parallel you know all the chefs all the cooks can use parallel kitchen and cook in parallel the same recipe but with slightly different ingredients so in this case slightly diff different books but the same process but parallelization comes with this kind of expensive management of the data and of the processes if you are really processing these 500 books there should be a good way for you to check you know did they all work which books still did not process and you know do i still need to rerun things so we are in this exercise here, we're kind of throwing you in this type of issue that is touching the parallelization, that is touching the management of a large uh, data set that could be, you know, multiple, multiple books in this case, or whatever multiple type of um, data files that you have. And on top of it, we also are touching the so-called modularity of the code, which will come later in another episode this week so that you know that some part of the code will need to be rerun identically for all the different inputs and then maybe there will be a more kind of conductor part of the code that is just controlling that everything works there are of course multiple ways to solve this you could just write your python script it could just be a for loop you know you pick your favorite language if you if you have one and uh, there are different ways of solving it. But when things start to scale a little bit further, it's good to start using these workflow tools. And this exercise that we will soon start will be about, we picked one workflow tool, that is the so-called snake make. Now, Samantha, do you want to briefly introduce the exercise? Yes. So that people can play a bit with this type of scenario and with snake make okay yes we have a short exercise preparation which we can do um, now together and then you can go into your groups or do the exercise by yourself that come below which are called workflow one and workflow two on this page so uh, i've seen on the um, notes document that most of you have already been here last week so you probably remember how to um, activate our um, code refinery environment. Conda activate code refinery and how 
what this is, we will also get back to uh, a little bit later today. Code refinery. That's the first thing we're going to do. Then we need to get this uh, word count repository, which is an, on our our code refinery GitHub um, page. Sorry, now I lost my terminal. Um, so we need to get this to our computer. And sorry if you haven't actually activated this this uh, environment yet, but you probably did it as part of your uh, uh, installation instructions. Um, so what we need to do now is to clone the um, the repository where we have our exercise material, which we do by git clone. And then this link, oh, I could have copied it just like that. Let me do that. So now we have uh, downloaded this word count directory onto our computer and we switch into this CD word count or wherever you put this. Um, and then you are ready to go for this exercise. There is also instructions on how to do this same thing on Binder. If you prefer to run this somewhere else than your own computer, you can try this. Um, and then we have workflow one where we do this kind of scripted solution that Enrico was talking about. In this case, it's not done with Python, but with Bash. But don't worry if you don't know how to write any Bash script, all the things that you need is here. So you can copy this into a file that's, that's called script.sh and then run it for all the files. And then discuss a little bit these questions um, that are mentioned here. And afterward, you can also check the solutions and see if you find anything new. And then uh, workflow two uh, will be about using SnakeMake. So we have prepared for you a kind of a recipe file on how Snake, how you can use SnakeMake to run this same workflow. Um, so this is already available in your repository. So you don't need to need to copy it or write this file. You can uh, take a look at it. What what is there? What how is it written? Um, can you find something that seems familiar from the bash script, for example? Um, so the exercise goal is to like take a look at this, and then run also the snake file. So basically, um, run this process for all the books using snake using snake file, uh, and then change something within this uh, snake file or within one of the scripts, and observe what's happened. What what's happening? Um, and then, yeah, we will come back here and we can discuss a little bit before we go on with this and why we use SnakeMake in this case. So we have now time uh, until about 10 o'clock finish time for this exercise. And after that, we right away have a break. So please also remember to take a break. Um, and we will see you here on stream again, 10, 10 finish time. So 10 past the hour. Did I forget anything, Enrico? Do you want to add anything? No, I think everything is fine. And, and okay. maybe just, uh, you know, don't worry if we are throwing you into this snake make. It's this kind, you know, problem-based learning. So figure out what you can figure out, but then we will cover the details when we come back. And remember to have the break, not just work. Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you also took the 10 minutes time for the break. Um, let's put in the HackMD, uh, in the notes also like how it went in the exercise because we are really interested to get to know about this. One 
um, question I spotted in the notes was uh, about the missing output file. And I'm not 100% sure uh, if this is related to it, but uh, if you run this snake make file, uh, if you run this snake make um, tool, then for me, the output looks something like this. There's first like it's telling what it's going to do. So first it's deleting stuff um, because we choose this delete all output. And then it shows you what um, it has found to actually run. And then it's showing you the different steps that it's actually running. And here in between, it also shows you the reason for each step. So why it is running a certain thing. So here is where I found this missing output files. And that in that case does not mean that it's um, missing or that it's an error. It's um, an information for you why it's actually running each of these steps. And uh, then in the end, you can check if it actually ran and um, completed successful by checking if you have these um, files in your plots and statistics directory. Um, so please let the questions come if you still are uh, wondering about something with this snake make. Um, we unfortunately don't have much time to go through it now, but please in the collaborative document, let us know how it went. Um, and if you have any further questions towards this. So why we chose snake make in this case is that compared to other uh, other workflow tools, and there are a lot out there and also field specific ones that you might find um, when you're looking for it in your domain, uh, because it has a rather gentle learning curve. So we could actually do this, what we did now that we threw you a little bit in the deep end of the pool and let you figure out things by yourself, because there is other tools that do the whole writing the script a little bit more complicated. So we chose SnakeMake for that. It's free open source and uh, we can install it via Conda or PIP. Um, about this, we will also get to in a moment. Um, it, it runs on the different platforms and it's heavily used in bioinformatics. So if you are a bioinformatician, then you will find a lot of examples and uh, how to use it with your kind of data also on their own um, web page and documentation. Um, you can define isolated software environments and um, you can find a example about this behind this here link. Um, you can also run these workflows in Docker or Obtainer containers. What containers are we will also get back to later. And um, you can run these same workflow tools on your own computer as well as on a, a supercomputer. So you don't need to change there anything. Um, SnakeMake can also run things in parallel. And uh, there is ways of archiving these workflows. And I mentioned that there are similar tools available. Here are a few that you can look into, but also try Googling your field and workflow tool. And maybe there is something coming up that is heavily used in your own field. OK, Enrico, do you want to go on? Yeah, I mean, in general, I see also some something related to this in the comments. It it might be the, your first time that you use a workflow tool, and you know, spending ten minutes, fifteen minutes with Snake Make, it it can be a little bit of a shock. But the whole goal they were trying to tell you here is that there are different levels of reproducibility, and replicability, and kind of you know, controlling for anything that could change, and then. It's not that from tomorrow you need to use version control and snake make and directory structure, standardized directory structure. So there are different levels and then you can start picking one so that, for example, you know, maybe not for the project that you have today, but maybe next month you start a new project. Maybe you might be deciding, well, maybe I'm going to try snake make for this project because I have to rerun the same pipeline for, I don't know, 500 subjects. In general, I can say that the experience from previous learners that decided to pick up Snake Make, at the end, they were very happy. At the end, they realized that it was beneficial to have a workflow tool so that they can actually reproduce the steps of their analysis and, you know, basically not end up in the scenario that after six months of peer review or one year of peer review, you're not able anymore to regenerate the same figures or rerun the big analysis with the changes that the reviewer asked. Maybe we don't have 
time to talk about the visualization of the workflow and this DAG, but um, this can be a homework. And you can ask, of course, in the collaborative notes. But now we kind of go in a little big, uh, larger time scale. So if you remember at the at the beginning, we had this pyramid where the article was just the tip of the of the pyramid, and there it, it's like you know that this is what most commonly the article is the only visible output, and then we understood that sometimes the article is not enough for reproducing what people have been doing. Sometimes there is some code attached to the article and sometimes there is data that would, could increase the chances of you know being able to reproduce what the article, what the authors of the article were obtaining. But then sometimes you might have the same data, the same code, even documentation that tells you even this snake make, even this workflow on how to rerun all the steps and still you wouldn't be able to 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 reproduce the same numbers, the same results of the published paper. And this scenario, unfortunately, is very common even if you're not working in science. So if you scroll a little bit down, Samantha, there is this funny cartoon picture from XKCD that, you know, if you ever been working with Python, but the similar issue can be with any other languages, you might realize that there is an intricate list like dependencies because every package, every tool might depend on some other tool. And so you can realize what sort of a network of dependency that different libraries that you need to rerun some existing code, this type of dependencies can be very intricate. So the issue that we're trying to solve here, that we're trying to, to tell you about in this in this part of the of the code refinery is basically, is there a way to control for the dependencies? So that if we again think of the kitchen analogy, yes, we understood that the recipe would be the software and we even have the step-by-step -step documented how to follow the recipe. Then we have the ingredients, read the data, but sometimes we need external tools, external libraries, usually they're called in the in the software engineering, so that we can actually, you know, that we are actually able to, in this specific case, reproduce and reobtain the same recipe. A little bit below, there are some kind of tools and some problems they try to solve. If you noticed before the exercise and also during the installation, if you prepare your uh, computer for this workshop, we just mentioned this Conda Activate, which some people might have wondered, what is this? What's going on? And you might have wondered this already when you were preparing your computer for the for the workshop with um, with Conda and install and some other spells like that. Well, basically Conda and Anaconda and Peep and all the other ones that you see listed there, they're just tools to create a so-called virtual environment. Idea being that normally people are used that you install a software in your computer, let's say that you install Python and that's the Python of that computer. But then you start realizing that you might need to rerun another project that was using a slightly different Python. You might need to change the libraries because you need something newer. And of course you don't want to touch the Python for the whole computer. And the same could be, I'm talking about Python, but it could be R, it could be Julia, it could be anything. So the idea of this virtual environment tools like Conda and Anaconda and PPM, et cetera, is exactly this, that it's like having multiple installations of Python or R or whatever, and making them self-contained self in a sense that, you know, that if you have a project running with a specific set of library and a specific set of, um, you know, dependencies, you can start a different environment, a different project, which might have different different requires than the, than the previous one. So this is why earlier Samantha was typing, I was telling you to type this Conda activate and the name of the code refinery environment, because then suddenly everyone's computer was kind of tuned with the same libraries, with the same dependencies, so that we could all obtain the same output and we could all basically do the same exercise with this uh, 
with this snake make. It would have been much more difficult if each of, if each individual learner would have their own version of Python, their own version of snake may obtaining different outputs. So already you understood that by having this conda environment, we made the exercise reproducible itself. So here there are, as it's mentioned here, you know that there are different kind of problems that we can try to be solved with this controlling of the environments. And um, maybe something that people sometimes mention is that is it some sort of a inefficient way of storing disk space if if I have 10 projects and 10 different environments and maybe all of them have NumPy. In general, I guess that maybe this inefficient use of the disk space still is a small price to pay for having clearly isolated environments that are easy to move to other computers or to share with other with other collaborators. But then, so maybe now it would be a good time to kind of dive into the exercise a bit. And I think we even have time to to even do it here in the in the stream, Samantha. What do you think? This yes, we can actually take a look at this dependencies one. We will not do like a break here on stream for you to do this exercise alone, but we can take a look at it together. So we have this uh, dependencies one time capsule of dependencies. And the situation here is that we have uh, five students that write a code that depends on a couple of libraries and they upload their projects to GitHub. And then we are now time traveling uh, three years into the future and we find these GitHub repositories. And then we try to rerun their code before we like continue to work on it. So it's always good to start and try to actually rerun what others have done before adding something to it so that you know actually this initial version works for you. Um, so we can use the notes document um, for this. Maybe let's choose the Conda uh, tab for now. Yeah. Um, so which version of these below ones and we'll go through them. Um, do you expect to be easiest to rerun and why? And what problems do you anticipate in each solution? So the different solutions are, um, for student A, you find a couple of library imports across the code, but that's it. So you really have to go into this um, code files and you have to search for import and then you find the names of these libraries that you might might want to install. For student B, there is a readme file and um, there is a list of libraries that were used, but without any versions. For student C, um, they use an environment.yaml file. So similar what we have provided for the code refinery environment with a name, with what channels are used and then the dependencies. Um, again, we don't find any versions and then also some um, PIP uh, dependencies. Uh, for student D, we also find an environment.yaml file, this time with versions. And also here before it was uh, for the GitHub repositories, it was linking to the master branch. Well, now it's linking to uh, a commit or a, a certain tag. And then we have uh, student E, where we find the environment.yaml file, um, again, with the versions. And at this time, the GitHub repositories are also actually packaged as package. So what do you think? Which one would you like to find or with which one would you be fine? Enrico, do you have some preferences yeah. here? Or do you see some difficulties? Case, case A has happened to me, and this is the archaeology work that I had to find when you only receive a script that says import NumPy, and maybe you have a clue that this was in 2016, then you can start time traveling and doing that. But maybe a question for you, Samantha, what is the actual difference between the C and the D? Because so in the C, there's no versions of all the packages. 
which maybe yeah, that can be problematic because if I create this environment in three years in the future, NumPy will be different than the NumPy of today. But the, this Git part here, so this basically means that I can run some pip install given a repository. Is that what it's doing basically? Isn't it? Yes. So uh, if you have some GitHub repository where you have some code or find some code that you want to use, you can basically install it here with pip. And um, in this case, it really looks at the master branch um, of this repository. And we have maybe already had contact with this issue that uh, nowadays this um, main branches are called main and not master anymore. Um, but also the master branch might actually change within three years. So there might be new developments. So it's actually not um, the same anymore, similar as with the versions of the packages. I see. So and then, then, so then the D1 would try to basically block the specific commit. So is, is that a yes. Nash, what we see there basically? Yes. Or uh, some tag, like I mentioned before, that you can also tag the um, a, a specific version that you, for example, submitted with a manuscript, um, and you can use this the same same way that you use this at and the tag name. So with that, you don't get the latest possible version, but the version that uh, is specified by someone as uh, delivered with something or ready for something. Like you can. Um, make a version of your software basically uh, public like this. But then if I go back to your original question, which student, which case would be the easiest to reproduce? I'm a bit undecided between. So D clearly, you know, try to fix everything even down to the specific commit ash of a specific Git repository. But maybe also E, is seems to be like a good solution. Would the difference with E meaning that this this whoever some user some project actually made a version of it and publish it so that if this GitHub repository disappears in three years in the future, this some project one point two point three is still so storing some you know more permanent place. Is that the difference between D and E or yeah. So I would also say like in E, the provider of some project and another project has put some more effort in it to make the these projects available also in the future, even if something changes with the GitHub repository and has made a more um, stable publication maybe of their, of their code than adding a tag. And you can do that actually for, for Conda. Um, there is this Conda Forge channel where you can publish your own packages if you want to. And there's really good instructions uh, in this Conda Forge channel about how to do that. What what do you need to add to your code to actually make this possible? This is maybe a personal question, but do you feel that you always publish a package or is it that more, if you have more reusable parts of your, of your project, then maybe those become a package and the least reusable ones, they are just in some um i would like to publish more packages because it would also make my life easier if i don't have to like dig into my old github repositories um but i don't actually do it um very often how about you yeah kind of same i, I try to make some packages although i've been using sometimes a server called uh, zenodo which is a little bit more permanent than storing them in in some version control git gitlab github but yeah i i'm still striving for the <laughs> for the best way of you know being reproducible with with my own with myself but yeah, maybe right, then uh, yeah. i mean no, go ahead what were you saying uh, and that's maybe also like what we also want to say here, like there is a lot of best practices out there, but uh, you don't have to like now go out and apply all of them. But mm -hmm. if you know about them and you if you have the time and you have the um, like, like you, you know that these exist, these ways that you can make your pro 
project more reproducible. So you can maybe plan in some more time for your next project to actually go a little bit further. And it can be one step at a time. It does not have to be everything at once. But I have a question for you now. So these students, okay, they have these five scenarios and looks like that this E scenario is the most reproducible one, but I don't see anywhere any mention, you know, that would this scenario work in all operating systems? Would would one should should this environment also specify that this was, you know, some specific version of Linux or 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 Mac or is is there a way? And that's a very good way to lead over to our next topic, which is recording environments. Um, so because you might have actually run into this issue already that like, okay, we, we told you to install certain packages and then maybe for a person on a Linux computer, this worked without problems. Maybe someone on a Mac had some other problems uh, that came up with this. And um, there is ways of how you can uh, package even more than just the dependencies of your code together and share it with others or also with your future self again. Um, so we'll be talking about containers now for the next 10 minutes and then have an, a discussion exercise also about the topic. Um, and yeah, so let's start with that and keep the questions and suggestions coming in the in the collaborative document. So as Enrico mentioned, like it's not always clear, like does this work actually on my machine? And very often um, when uh, we also go to our colleague or uh, the creator of a certain software or something, uh, there is this first wondering, hmm, but it works on my machine. I have no idea why it might not work on your machine. <laughs> And uh, containers are one way to help with that because um, you can basically set up any kind of uh, environment, any kind of operating system uh, within your own um, computer, no matter what is your own operating system. And then you can package really everything into this. You can add even data, you can add your code, you can uh, use Conda to have a... Uh, like Conda environment within your container. And you can package this all together and share it um, all together. And the receiver of this package that you are sharing that needs to install then only uh, one software. And that's then a software that can uh, like actually use these um, files that you are sending and recreate the environment in their own computer. So there is this, this meme here um, Docker is one of these um, container tools. Uh, Singularity and Aptainer you might have heard if you're working on a supercomputer. Or then there's also more like Podman, I think is another one. And if we go back to our kitchen analogy, so we have been talking about this already a little bit. So now we have our codes and script, which are like our cooking recipes. We have container definition files. These are like blueprints to build a certain kitchen with all the utensils, um, with, all, with all the ingredients maybe that you need to prepare a certain recipes. And then we have something called container images or Im image files. These are then example kitchens. This is how a kitchen that is built from this container definition file may look like. And then on top of that, we have the containers. And these are then uh, identical factory built mobile food truck kitchens that are built in the same way um, um, as the example kitchen. And you can take a look and take also, I guess, like what kind of operating systems these uh, images here represent. I find it quite funny. So uh, just take a look and see what you can guess. Um, so yeah, we can bundle everything and, um, now you hopefully maybe also have an idea of what these different things are. So we have these definition files, the blueprints, then these container images, which are these example kitchens. And if you want to think about it a little bit more, um, abstract way, 
Um, you can also imagine it so that we have this container image always in the bottom, which where you have the operating system, where you have your code. And then when you create a container on top of it, you add some transparent layers on top of it where you can do stuff like you can run the software, you can install additional packages, you can uh, do whatever you need to do. Um, but when you close the container, that's actually already gone. So, so the, the image is not touched, so you can rerun things all the time. You can test out things. It's great for prototyping. It's great for uh, trying out different things. Um, and later, when you have found a way on how you can do everything you want to do, like running your software, having all the dependencies there, then you write this down in this um, definition file so and that you can then share with your colleagues so that they can build the same same thing. Um, and then also, if these containers are now new for you, and that would actually be a question that we could put in the uh, collaborative document, like, have you had any um, contact with containers yet? Was it good contact or bad contact? Um, do you think you have use for them in the future? Uh, let us know, and we can take a look at that. So. You may have use for containers in, in many different ways. Um, so for example, maybe you have run into this issue that you found a software that would solve all your needs. Like you don't have to write your own scripts. You can just use this software um, to do your research with. But then uh, you only find uh, installation instructions for Ubuntu, but you are running on Windows or CentOS or some other operating system. And uh, you find that for your own operating system, it's actually quite um, complicated to, to, to build this software, to run this software. So that would be uh, one way where you can then go on pages like uh, Docker Hub, for example, where people um, share images of containers that may run this software already. If it's a popular software, it's highly likely that, it's, that this already exists and that someone has already put thought into it and created this and you can just reuse it. So you don't even in this case have to worry about um, writing this definition file. You could just reuse what some, someone else has already done. Um, but another way is also you can start writing these definition files and we will take a look at how these definition files look in uh, the exercise. Um, to uh, use, for example, Ubuntu operating system, if that's where your software is provided, um, and like install it to there and then um, use that container yourself. Um, and then also if your colleague asks for like, how do I run your software? And it's maybe very, tricky to install all these um, dependencies. It's like a lot of um, system libraries that you need for, for your software to run. And then uh, on top of that, maybe some Conda um, packages. Then you can, instead of sending them a list, okay, do this first, do that second, do that third, you can write um, this container definition file and you can even then share this image that you create create based on the definition file or the definition file itself. Um, yes, and so this container definition file or container recipe or Docker file, as they are sometimes called, um, they have all, no matter which of these uh, tools you're using, they all have kind of the similar setup. So first you tell them, um, what kind of so-called base image you want to use. So in the Ubuntu case, for example, maybe we have a software where the installation is very easy on Ubuntu 20.4, uh, so we can get Ubuntu image from, in this case, Docker um, and use it as our base image. So that, that gives us a whole Ubuntu installation. Then we can, add some um, some other system libraries or like some um, other tools um, by using Ubuntu's um, manager, like by apt-get install Kause and lolcat, for example. We can also set some environment variables here, similar as we would do from our command line. And then we can also right away run some script so that 
um, when someone starts this container, uh, it runs some software already. Um, and that's up to you if you want to have that like this, or if you want people to actually work in your container. So, I have a so I mentioned, yeah. Is this basically like installing? It, it, this would be like a script for installing an operating system and updating it and adding all the things that I need, but without actually, you know, buying a new computer and installing everything yes. from scratch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was wondering if we should already jump on the exercise because yes, it's already one past and then later wrap up with the good and bad sides of, of working with containers. But basically this exercise is uh, self-contained. <laughs> it's a container, self-contained exercise. So you will not actually create a container right now. It, it, um, it requires... You know, you should install Docker or something, and then it takes time to download because you literally have to imagine that you are downloading an operating system and, and installing it. But so you could be more like um, a reviewer, a code reviewer that someone you're working with actually wrote a container recipe that we see here. But your goal is to, you know, check that this will go and will work three years in the future. So here below in this... Um, Python project using virtual environment. This is a long recipe that would basically do like like what I was just asking, kind of installing uh, Ubuntu latest in this case, and then running some commands that would need to update or install some specific libraries, Python 3 in this case. So now you have to think that this definition file, someone receives it three years in the future, and they need to recreate the same container. But you might be guessing already that what you get today by running this recipe, by kind of installing or creating this container environment, it might not work or it might work differently in three years in the future. So the exercise right now is exactly this. You are reviewing this recipe, this definition file, and try to think of all the lines of code and all the commas that would be you know, would kind of break or give something different three years in the future from now. You can read more detail the description of the exercise. And there's, of course, a solution box if you are stuck or if you're unsure, if you just want to, you know, learn by reading the solution. In practice, we were thinking of um, giving a little bit less than 20 minutes so that we are able to meet again at the hour, 12 o'clock in Finland, 11 in Central European time, so that we can have a little bit of a wrap up of what we did. And then this kind of ends the first part of the day for Code Refinery. Then there will be the lunch break. And after that, we will continue with the second part of the day. How does this sound, Samantha? Yes, that sounds really good. So containers one, it's the exercise. And we actually don't let you, or we actually don't require you to install any of these um, tools and let you do the exercise here because it can be quite um, a hassle and you also can go take quite long to actually download these files. So you can try this at home, containers too, if you want to after. All right, so I'm updating the collaborative, collaborative notes. And of course, if you have questions, you can write there. And let's get back to this in about 15 minutes. So welcome back. I thought, uh, I hope you had some time to discuss these uh, files in your group or by yourself. And I hope you also found the solution um, that we put here so that you found these things that uh, sometimes, what does latest mean actually now and what does it mean in three years? Um, and all these different things. We did not have time to take a closer look at um, pros and cons of containers, but we have the material here. So please take a look at this yourself. 
um, maybe you can identify some some uh, situations that you have been in already or maybe in the future you will be in. And then just briefly also, um, since you can get these images from a lot of different places, um, have an eye on like to use only these official and trusted images that's very vague um, but not all images can be trusted so take a look at how many are using them when it was last updated where this image actually um, comes from who created it to have some kind of guess of can this image be trusted and ask a colleague if you don't know about this so I'll give the word to Enrico for the wrap up. So where do we go from here with all this new knowledge? Yeah, so the last page for this um, for this episode before the lunch break is exactly, okay, you were exposed to different level of, uh, how can I say, reproducibility of your project, of your findings, of your of your research. And now it's up to you to kind of pick, okay, I want to improve one dimension of the reproducibility of my project. How, where should I start? In general, as long as you already understood how this is important for every project, it's already a good start. Having a clear file structure is something that maybe most likely you already have, but if you don't have kind of a standard one, or if you didn't agree, if you didn't spend time with your colleagues on a standard one, maybe it's time to do it, for example, for your next project that you decide at the beginning, you know, let's write a readme file that is telling that in this subfolder, we have the original data, in this other folder, we have the code, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes it just easier to for you and for others, and also for the future, you, when you need to go back to this project. Then you've been exposed to these workflow tools. You know, is it something you want to start using today? Is it something you want to pick up later? In general, if you are again starting a new project and you realize that you will need to run the same code, the same process hundreds of time, maybe you don't want to start inventing your workflow, how to track, you know, which runs, which parameter have been run, which one are still missing. Then it's worth investing in learning one of these workflow tools. And again, it's good to check in your in your discipline, which one is the most famous or most used. And then, because it's a new project, you can start with playing and learning and then use it for the actual project. And maybe if you really need to pick one and you really need to want to worry about something, I would worry about dependencies, you know, because for the structure, okay, maybe it's not the standard for the structure, but you know, I can go inside your folder and still understand where's the date and where's the code. But if the dependency are not documented anywhere, it makes the life of other people who want to reuse or just pick up where your project was left. And even for yourself, the, the fact that we just face these issues that you're not able to reinstall the libraries, you're not able to rerun the code, and that's lost of kind of, you know, wasted time in this, in this unfortunate things that... Um, that should not happen if you can fix the dependency at the very beginning. And last, about containers, they also have a bit of a learning curve. So maybe it's not something that you need today. Simple project with clear dependencies and, and clear steps maybe don't require all this level of, uh, you know, documentation up down to the type of the operating system and libraries. But there are, of course, other advantages beyond reproducibility for the containers, because sometimes you might work on your laptop, but then you want to move your analysis on some large HPC cluster, or you want to give basically what works on your laptop to some other colleague. So containers then become a a, a good tool, especially in, in those cases where maybe the person receiving the container is not allowed to install new things or, or modify the operating system. So then uh, it, it improves also the collaboration with you, with, with your future self and with others, and not just uh, this kind of reproducibility perspective. But I guess, yes, I think this is enough for now. We are going to resume in basically 55 minutes with the social coding part with Radovan and Yarno will be on stream. Thank you, Samantha, for the great and clear explanations. And it was nice to teach with you. If you have any other comments. 
thanks to you too. Excellent. And thanks for all the good questions in the HackMD. We will, uh, in the notes, we will take a look yes. at them also still. Okay, see you later. Bye. Bye.